236 if you'd like your hymn book. Take a deep breath and sing this to the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Verse 3. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there, Ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no less days To sing God's praise Than when we first begun Thank you, Ella. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. I believe Children's Church, ones that are here, can slip right on out on us. You can graduate up to the big class. Still a nice group of kids, good, even on this, on this morning. Good to see. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. There's a parallel account in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. We'll turn to it in just a, just a few moments. It's going to be, be a long message, but I trust it be a blessing to you. Mark 14, verse 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of the unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat down at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. I was tempted to call the message, the straw that broke the camel's back. But I think we'll just stick with the gospel and its memorial. 
the gospel and its memorial. And it's somewhat in a combined conjunction also this afternoon service for this evening be um, similar to that. The scornful or a bad seat and its sign. A bad seat and its sign. But there's something similar to this even from Wednesday night as message leads to message and one springs to another. When I saw that it come towards the end of verse 5 and it says, and they murmured against her. On Wednesday night, we had to study. Well, let's have this word of prayer. The gospel and its memorial. Holy Father, in Jesus' name, once again, we pray that the message would have your anointing on it and be a blessing for coming. May we be the better for it. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wednesday night, I was talking about connecting the dots of the Old Testament and New Testament. And those that had come out of Egypt with Moses were identified with Moses. And then we'll come back to that briefly. But when it says these were written for our examples, and then it says in verse, 11, verse 6, and it's 1 Corinthians 10, 6, and 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, and these were written for our examples, I share in a Sunday school class, well, then learn from this. Even Paul wrote to Corinthians, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. The idea is I want you to learn from them. There are examples. And uh, to connect the Old Testament and New Testament, how relevant it is. Well, one of the things, verse, somewhere around like verse 7 or so, like 10, it says, and they murmured. And with many of them, God was not well pleased. They had that low... Well, doctors say if he hear, detects a rushing in a heart valve or he hears an offbeat with the stethoscope, we may be unbeknownst to us, but he'll say there's a heart murmur. There's a low guttural sound that's constant. You can hear it with the stethoscope, may not hear it. Israel had that low guttural complaining and that low guttural griping, and no matter where Moses led what they did, it would resurface, sometimes louder than others, but... I realize in Old Testament, New Testament, what this woman, woman did, there was that low guttural complaining and griping and, you know, and criticizing of her. They murmured. I can see the whispers back and forth. I can see them talking to themselves. And we come to this thing. It is Memorial Day weekend. The honor and remembrance of those who served, and as it says in the definition, and gave the last full measure of devotion to their country. Those who served and gave their last full measure of devotion to the country. Well, I guess that is devotion. They gave their life for it. Well, this passage here is going to talk about the devotion of this woman. Principal characters are going to be some religious leaders, priests, scribes. As we see in John's account, so the Pharisees, the religious hierarchy of the day. We'll see the primary character being this woman, of course, as she ministers to Jesus. And then Jude, or Judas, is also included in this passage by name. So he's also a principal character. For the priests and scribes, we'll see their envy and their hatred. That they're planning on this day, how they, by craft, by, with a conspiracy, by their subtility, illegally capture Jesus to have him put to death. That's their plans. We'll see that the woman gives a measure of devotion that is still spoken about today. And then there's Judas. Judas. And his decision on, on this episode and what he does. She hath done what she could. She did it when she could. I think the same thing we see in this passage when Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do good to them, or do them good. Well, always have the poor. Who said so? Jesus. There is no program. There is, for whatever reasons, not going to go into it, there is no great society that eradicate the poor class and those in need. Sometimes it's by health. 
Sometimes it's by work ethic. Sometimes it's just by opportunity or of the times. There were many good, honest people that in the Great Depression found themselves poor. The poor you will all have with you always. And since you will always have them, you will always have an opportunity to do good by them and to help them. But me have not always. At this time, in this instance, right here at this place, in Bethany, on the doorsteps of Jerusalem, in the week of Christ's passion, um, Jesus is already acknowledging you won't have this opportunity again. Other opportunities you have to help the poor, but you won't have this opportunity again. She not only did what she could, she did it when she could. It's a reminder of Ecclesiastes 12, verse number 1, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. There are certain times the door of opportunity knocks that will never knock again. And she knew that. And she operated in that. She did what she could. In this passage it says, uh, well, let's go ahead and read John chapter 12 so we have her name. John chapter 12, verse number, uh, let's start one through three. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Just for my way of study, I can share this with you. He's six days out from Calvary. He's six days out from the crucifixion. The Passover day, he is the Lamb of God come to fulfill the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. He's six days out. He's just a mile out. When it says this, where Lazarus, which had been, raised, was, had been raised from the dead, there made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him? Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared. That, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, because, but because he was a thief and had to beg and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to de death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. I wanted you to have that other gospel account and some of the details in that. She has done what she could. An alabaster box, similar to maybe what we'd call a, an onyx box or a quartz box. Up in the travel station on 77, up towards Beckley, in the tourist thing, they have some of those little jewelry boxes made of the stones from West Virginia. It's really pretty, and it's fairly costly. But it is attractive. Whether it's sealed or it could be opened or it was encased and then the top sealed on it, she breaks that fine stone box. In that box is the ointment of spikenard. It even says in this passage that it's very expensive and it uses the word precious because it was. To make it was expensive in the process of making it. It was considered and used for these things. An embalming oil. It was the custom of those days, if someone passed away, that they be buried within 12 to 24 hours. Because there was no internal work done with them, such as a manner of the Egyptians, still copied somewhat today. 
but it was all surface so they could anoint their skin and keep it pliable and uh, well smelling as possible for as long as possible for the day of mourning. It was a, an embalming oil preserving skin. It was an enhancing oil. It was used by those who had the money for medicinal purposes. So maybe it was the, in the hot air climate, they could use it for their skin treatments. It was, because of its aroma, an enchanting oil. Those who had the money could purchase it, and also folks would know that they had, they had a finer perfume of the day. It was exclusive. It was mostly just for the wealthy. Just for the wealthy. She took this container with this ointment in it and broke it open. Whether by her fingertips or whether by pouring, she placed it on Jesus. We see in John's gospel that she will use her hair to dry his feet as she'd place it probably on his forehead or on his head and on his feet. She had done what she could. 300 pence. If we see in the scriptures someday, it said, and he agreed with them to work in the, in the fields for a penny a day. It was a common day's wage. Don't associate with our penny or a penny on the dollar or a hundred. It, it was a staple of money and of a, of a currency that was a day's wage. And we realized with 300 of these, if you exclude holidays and Sabbath days and feast days, and you realize this, this is the average yearly wage of the working days for someone in those times. That's pretty expensive. Mary, Martha, Lazarus' house, she took this and broke it. She anoints Jesus with it. She wipes his feet with her hair of this oil. And when others led, seems to be by Judas, and some had Ignatian, and that murmuring spirit affected others, began to murmur against her and complain, why wasn't this sold to feed the poor? John's gospel lets us know she did what she could, but this is the straw that broke the back of the character of Judas, and he did what he could. I know, and I didn't look it up, the exact root of it today, but I think most are familiar with the term, of the Arabic fable of the man for his greed wanting to get just a little bit more goods on his camel instead of, you know, I know what I call it today. I call it the lazy man's load. You know why I call it that? When I open the trunk and it's got the groceries in it, I don't want to make two trips, Right? Now, it's okay if you can get all the plastic bags loaded up your arm. And by the way, $200 doesn't put many plastic bags on your arm anymore, does it? But you load them up, on, and then there's the bottle, and then there's the milk, and maybe there's a case of this. And next thing you know, you, you're going to, you look like a juggler going to the house. Why? Because you don't want to take another trip. The lazy man's load. Well, that's pretty much to the Arabic fable where I don't want to make another trip and I want to take as much as I can but if I put one more handful or sheaf of, of uh, on the camel's back and the camel collapsed to the ground and then Abraham stood back and said you know of all that was done and all the weight on the camel load that was the straw that broke the camel's back this scene right here Mary doing what she could when she could do it was the straw that broke the character of Judas. Make sense? What was it? Well, John tells us, John tells us that Judas complained. And he's the one who speaks to Jesus and says, could not this have been sold and, and given, distributed to poor? That's a year's wages. John's revelation Inspired by the Holy Spirit would also say, not that he cared for the poor. It was a speech, and it sounded good, but it's not what he really cared for. He had no intentions of that money going to the poor, or wouldn't have liked it if it had. 
it says this, that he held the bag. The simple, and that's the one place we have in the scriptures, but there's another likeness to it in the scriptures. He's the treasure of the apostles. He's the one in charge of the finances. He's the one, and you see the likeness in the passage, when, when he went out from the Last Supper and the rest of the apostles, supposing that he went to take care of the necessities of the things of the feast, he went out to pay for the room. He went out to pay for the supplies. Why? He's the treasure. He has a bag. Watch this. He was trusted by the rest of the apostles. Even what Jesus is saying, the one who dips the sop with me at the table shall betray me, they didn't think as Judas. Even when he went out, they supposed he was taking care of the finances. When it says that he was the first to complain, when it says that he held the bag, he trusted, but it simply says he was a thief. It's not implied to me anywhere in any direct scriptures, but this lets me know whatever was coming into the treasury bag and whatever Judas was trusted with, he could not be trusted with it. Since John inspired, writes that he was a thief, he wanted that money for personal reasons. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he wasn't embezzling and they didn't know it. But can I go on with that saying this? Mary did what she could when she could do it. Judas will now go out and do what he can do. And what did he do? He went and shared with those chief priests who wanted to put away Jesus and wanted also to put away Lazarus. He went out and conspired with them. And what did he get for it? Everybody knows this from all the children's church, Saint school lesson. He got 30 pieces of silver. Judas is motivated by greed. Judas is motivated by what he can get. He's in the ministry of the apostles for what it come to him. This act of devotion spurred Judas to his act of destruction. And the character of Mary is revealed that she takes this very expensive ointment and with great devotion gives it, sacrifices it, and anoints Jesus to his bearing. And Judas goes and sells out Jesus. And basically, there's another passage in John that reveals he could share with them when they could take Jesus alone. You see, their fear was not to take him in great crowds of people. Their fear was not for the people to have an uproar. They're, they're, by craft, they want, to, they want to condemn him and be done with it before the people have any way to respond to it in a great... So Judas could come and he can share with them in John's gospel where Jesus could be taken, and it says, alone. And Judas knew where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when they could take him in the night, take him alone, not in the crowds of people. And Judas gives them that information. 30 pieces of silver. Turn with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. And wheresoever this night, wheresoever what Mary did, wheresoever what, this, what Judas did, <clears throat> that this gospel should be preached, this shall be a memorial unto her. Romans 13, verse 10. Be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. 
don't know how often I read or I hear folks saying, well, that's Old Testament. I can read in the book of Proverbs where he talks about if your enemy curse you, then, then treat him with kindness and therefore reap coals of fire on his head. I can, I can read in the Old Testament the corners of the fields to be rounded off so that the orphans and the widows and the poor could have the corners. I could read in, in the Old Testament of taking the gleanings from the garden or from the vines and only harvest it once and not go back because the rest of it, whatever you missed, is for the orphan and the widow and the poor. I can read in the Old Testament, uh, do unto, as is the second great commandment, do unto your neighbor as you'd have your neighbor do unto you. I can read that if your neighbor's cow or horse or camel get out, pin it up till you can return it, not finders, keepers, losers, weepers. I can see how if by accident you break something you borrowed from your neighbor to restore it to him and make it right. I can read all that in the Old Testament. So if I hear people say, oh, that's the Old Testament. I see in the New Testament, Jesus said when he took the good Samaritan from a different region, not related, not his civil responsibility, not his religious responsibility, but he finds the man who's been beaten and left for dead, and he takes care of him, and he pays for his place at the end and his medical treatments. I read in the New Testament when the man said, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, and who's neighbor unto this man? The obvious answer was, you are. So I read in the book of Romans. I call it, I consider it one of the great views of the scriptures of Christian living, sound doctrine. I read in this passage to be a not slothful in business. So we have the idea, be a good worker. Fervent in spirit. So we have an energetic and uh, positive attitude. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. New Testament, I'm going to say this, do what you can and do it now. She hath done what she could. Just that simple. I put it this way. Do what you can and do it now. You must be born again. To think that someday I will, someday I'll put my faith and trust in Jesus. Someday I'm going to make a deathbed confession. Should there ever be such a thing. What guarantee do we have of that? Someday, uh, boy, I'm, uh, you know, the last week of my life, uh, I'm going to get right with the Lord like we would know. Do what you can and do it now, for now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. No, you know what's right? The Holy Spirit speaking that it's right. The Scriptures testify that it's right. Prayers of people have been for it to be so. Do what you can and do it now. You must be born again. Amen? And when I think of that, you ought to be baptized. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 says, And they that gladly received the word were baptized. You've joined the team. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The coach comes out and says, here's what we're going to wear. Our uniform is blue. You don't say, I don't want to wear it. I want to be on the team, but I don't want the uniform. Put the uniform on. Romans chapter, we're close to it. Romans chapter 6. Do what you can. Do what you know is right and do it now. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Reading this passage in this likeness, what it is. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? By the way, it's not literal death. It's a symbol of death. The children of Israel were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea. Yep, they were inundated. They were put under Moses' leadership, but they went across on dry ground. They never got wet. It was symbolic of something. They are now completely under Moses' leadership. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, 
through 5, they were no longer serving and under Pharaoh's bondage. They are free and they're going to live a new life in the, in the wilderness heading towards the promised land. We're going through this wilderness world. We are headed for a promised land. And my friends, we are under new leadership. Baptism is a symbol of that. Well, shall we read verse number 4? Therefore we are buried with him. With, with him by baptism is not real bapt it's not real death it's not real burial it's a symbol of that and uh, unto death and like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so should we also walk in newness of life you know what i read in the scriptures book of acts there is no of all the books in the New Testament scriptures, remember a week or so ago I said, how many of it end just like Revelations 22, verse 21 and 22 ends it? Um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Like nine of the books in the New Testament all end the same way because there's an ending. You know what major book doesn't? Be, I mean, besides the Gospels, which were letters of the life of Christ, testimonies of the life of Christ. You know which book doesn't? The book of Acts. The book of Acts has no ending. It just goes along and it has the introduction, the birth, the birth of the church, the power of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. We have the churches being founded. We have the first missionary trips. We have the life of Paul taking the missionary letter to, to, to the Gentiles and boom, the book is over. No ending. Why? Because it's continuing. It's the acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the acts of the church. It's the acts of those that are the ones that are sent out. It's the acts of those who believe. And they that gladly receive the word were baptized. Get baptized. Do what you can. Do when you can do it. Amen. Do what you can. We come in the scripture and think we should love the brethren. I read this passage. Nothing so, nothing so grieving as the Old Testament we should learn from this example is the constant every step with the murmuring and griping and complaining along the way. Be given to hospitality. Distribute to the necessity of those in need. Kindness. Kindness. Churches can get a testimony. I think back to the message, which church would you join from the book of Revelation? And I don't even know that I spoke it. It was in a revival service in Florida. Which church would you join? I went through the book of Revelation of seven churches and said, if this is what the church was like, which church would you join? Isn't that an interesting question? The one that's lost its first love and told to repent? The one that was married to the world and worldly as all get out? The one that had the woman Jezebel leading the church and was seducing the same. Which church would you join? The Laodicea church that had the nice facilities. And the big program. But something was wrong. So I was thinking, churches can get a personality. <clears throat> we was visiting a church and North Carolina. No, we weren't visiting church. I was eating at a little hot dog shop in a tourist area outside of Boone. And the waitress said, you're a preacher? We was talking to John a preacher? Yeah. She said, well, you ought to apply for the church. And pointed right up the hill, little, I shouldn't say little. It's actually a really nice, impressive white country church. Instead of a small one, it was a much bigger one, but the same design. So really pretty up on the hill. She said, They've had five pastors in two years. <laughs> they are the meanest people. That's the waitress testimony of the church on the hill. Churches and groups get testimonies. It was, you know what the waitress told us at the Cracker Barrel? It was about winter time. There was ski lodge. A lot of ski people were coming into it. You know what she said? Oh, we don't like to see the buses come in with young people. They don't tip. They've never been told and taught how to give tips. She said, so we can serve 30 young people and get, a little, and get the leftover change. We like to see buses come in with white-haired old people. Oh, good. The old, the old folks come in. It's just a simple little testimony. You think groups don't get tests? 
You know what the, you know what the manager told us at a motel where the ball teams are there? They fear certain Christian schools coming. Why? Because they're rowdy all night in the hall. You can get a testimony. A church can get a testimony. A youth group can get a testimony. Amen? How about a testimony of hospitality? Do what you can, when you can, what you know to do. She had done what she could. I'm, I'm, I'm heading up to it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, if you want to turn to it, I'll start quoting it. You go, oh, no, it's going to scare us again with that. And forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, I've said it so many times, I, I've accidentally memorized it. Um, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Some are. That's the manner of some. And so much the more when you, as you see the day approaching. General question, I'll ask it. You can raise the hand in your heart. You don't need to raise your hand so the person beside you won't feel you raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand at all, but you just can answer this question in your heart. Do you think that Jesus is coming again? I'll do it for you. Do you think Jesus is coming again sooner than later? Do you think? Do you think everything you're seeing going on and around the world has something to do with Christ's return, this globalization, and everything that's involved with it? Then, Brother Rick, what should you do? Assemble with the believers more often than not. Amen? I know what to do, and now I have the opportunity to do it, and this I should do. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, puts it this way. And this is another one you'll know when we start reading it. I think Proverbs 3 is one of my top 10 chapters in scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I didn't even think of the song that goes with it, but I know it's, it's introduced with this. You want to see a really pretty ornament hanging around you? Devotion to the Lord. Now let's go down to verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. You know Solomon is just using the terminology here of the honoring the Lord with tithes. He's using the very same terms that are used in the description of giving tithes unto the Lord into the storehouse. He's talking about the increase of all our substance and the first fruits of it off the top. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I think I know what the Scripture teaches about giving and honoring the Lord with what I get first. Well, I'd say, oh, there's the Old Testament. <clears throat> I have a simple answer to that. You see, I'm not complicated. I'm, I'm reading. I can read some brilliant scholars from the past, and I look at them and say, oh, man, how did they know that so much? Right now, I'm reading a 175-year-old book. The book itself is, it's not, it's a reprint. I am enjoying it thoroughly. It has nothing to do with theology, but I'm getting theology out of it I, uh, in an unbeknownst way. Can I tell you what it is? You know who Samuel Clemens is? Mark Twain. I'm not reading Huckleberry Finn. But he, all, he did write a personal journal of a one-year trip he took, not all the way around the world, but a lot of the world. He took a one-year steamship trip to Europe, Middle East, and Africa. He wrote his journal. His journal is deeper than my thinking. His description of people and things and places are, I said, I can't even... And he was writing this in the 1860s, 1866 and 7 or something like that. And I'm reading through that and I said, that man's brilliant. 
He's writing of things he's seeing that are descriptive of the Bible lands. He's writing of things where he came in just outside of Tangier. And outside of Tangier is a monument. He read what he wrote was on the monument. said, we are the Canaanites driven out of our land by Joshua the robber. He's confirming in a memorial 100 and some years, 50 better years ago, in a memorial of the Canaanites who were driven out, whom they considered Joshua the robber. He's writing how the Muslims considered the Christians, which he was considered because he's from the West, and called them Christian dogs. Gentiles were called dogs. He's writing about how a Muslim and how he almost made the mistake of stepping into a mosque, and then the, the tour guide stopped him and realized in the mosque, <clears throat> Christians, Westerners, or dogs are not allowed to enter into the mosque. The one mosque in one of the city had a mechanical clock. No one could fix the clock of the Arabic, uh, of the Muslim community. They found a European clockmaker, but he's a Gentile dog. So they said, how are we going to fix our clock? One of the caliphates said and made a decision, well, we let donkeys or asses cross the threshold to carry materials in if this Gentile dog will identify himself as a donkey and crawl in, we'll let him fix our clock. And that's what they did. I'm reading, what a world! You know, and, and what, what, how people acted. And, and yet I realize all this sameness. And folks say, well, that's the Old Testament. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews talks to me and gives me more information. Hebrews lets me know that Enoch not just didn't walk with God and was not, just disappeared, but he was translated that he should not see death. Hebrews tells me that Abraham went up on Mount Moriah. I'm left with a lot of questions in the Old Testament. How could God ask a man to do such a thing? And how did Abraham have faith to do such a thing? Hebrews tells me he went up there esteeming that God would raise him from the dead. Abraham already believed in a resurrection. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews tells me that Jesus is the express image and character of God revealed to us today. It tells me he's better than Moses. It tells me he's better than the angels. It tells me he's a better sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 7 tells me this. Let's read verse uh, verse number 7. And without all contradiction, the less is better of the blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes. Yep. New Testament, Hebrews, guess what? If you tithe in the Old Testament, your tithe helped feed the priest. It was a gift to the Lord. If you tithe in the Old Testament, your tithe helped keep the tabernacle in good repair, or later, the temple. If you tithe in the Old Testament, you bought furnishings and carpenters and the for the maintenance and upkeep and furnishing of the temple. Yep. And guess what? But it was unto the Lord that you gave it. And here that men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them. Present tense. You give it here, but he gets it there. Watch this. Of whom it is witness that he liveth. Watch. When someone gives their tithes and offering, yep, it pays for the utility of the church. When someone gives their time, and everyone ought to do their fair share of that. Who would go into a restaurant and say, I hope that someone else gets a bill. I'm just going to hold back, make sure they get it. Don't you try and do your part? No, no, let me have that. Well, let me get the tip. Let me do that. Don't you do that? Isn't that just a good, honest, hardworking thing to do? Or ethical thing to do? Do you sit back and say, I hope someone else mows the grass. I'll, I'll get it Friday if no one else can get it. I hope someone, don't you all want to do your part? Oh, come on, I'm just preaching good common sense here. That's worth a good holy grunt or murmur. Amen? Something. So this, watch this, and here's a testimony. Yes, when you give, it pays you utilities. Yes, when you give, it's unto him. It sure is. Your giving and tithes and offering are not just to the preacher. It pays his salary. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for it. I'm a grateful person for it. It pays the health insurance, but it pays some. It, it pays the utilities. It puts air conditioning unit on it. It helps us have a nursery that's cool, not hot. Yes, it does, but it's unto him. And it has a testimony. 
What is the testimony? That he lives. I serve a risen Savior. I go to church for a risen Savior. I give tithes and offerings for a risen Savior. This is not even a message on tithing. This is a message on this. You know what you should do. Do it while you can. Do what you, do what you can. Amen? I come to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I was thinking back to that. One of the best things, I guess, we're just new Christians. You know how new Christians are. You want to do everything to please the Lord. My mom was more so that way. We're all first-generation Christians. Kind of got saved at the same time. So I got my first job at the grocery store, you know, 13 years old, bagging groceries. A cup of super value, you know, so I'm a grocery bagger. But at that time, we not only bag your groceries, we put them in a big buggy, and then we wheeled them out to the car for people, put them in the car. So in the north, that's a big deal. You Sometimes you're out there all... You know, 10 below zero, wind blowing thing. So the people would wait in the store while you put it in their car. So, like, so but I'll tell you what, we're all first generation Christians. And so I'm, I'm making my dollar and four cents an hour. Seemed like a lot to me then. When I got my job at the lumber yard, I got $4.14 an hour. I was rich. You know. But I got my dollar and nine cents an hour, four cents an hour. And I bring my little, I bring my paycheck home, and Mom say, "Okay, <clears throat> here's a, here's your tithe to the Lord, here's your spending money, and here's your saving money for college. Deal with it, <laughs> you know. Okay, but hey, it's serving the Lord. It's in my head. That's how we serve the Lord. And that five dollars of spending money, when before long, you know, <clears throat> Miss Tammy was." Already driving at 14. That's just what you do in the farmlands, you know, like that. She, she had a little Volkswagen like that. She's buzzing around town at 14 years old. So I got my Ford Falcon at 15 years old. But that $5 worth of gas, mom gave me 5 I had to go and ask the boss for a raise, not the boss at the store, my boss mom. I'm running, my $5 you're allotting me for spending money. I'm, I'm spending that in gas. I need, I need two more dollars. that is ingrained in me wasn't is tithing because the Lord lives and we want to honor him. It's a testimony we serve a living Savior. Uh, we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse, just verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus said, I have a great desire, desire to eat this meal with you all. And his great desire was, and I shall drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Study the book of Revelation, let me know that there's coming a great marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's the title that's given to it. But there's a great banquet coming. And just like we're loading a trailer with a, all those scrap metal, and then finally there's the last big piece of scrap metal, and pick it up, and Brother Matherly said, oh, that's the one we've been looking for. Well, we'd known that. We'd pick that one up first, right? Loading some logs on a trailer in the afternoon. <clears throat> Throwing a bunch of logs on a trailer, and finally, oh, Throwing them in the bush, bush pile, and finally come the last one and say, Oh, this is the one we've been looking for. Someday Jesus is coming again. He's going to gather around all the saints. They're all dressed in white. A, I don't even know how to describe it. A lavish dinner banquet like no one's ever seen. Based on the wealth of the one who provided it. It gives you an idea. And he'll hold up a cup and they'll say, this is the one we've been looking for. All that mess down there is done. We're all together. Let's have a dinner. When I come to the New Testament, Mark 14, I wonder why on a, such a day as this, we remember those who gave their last full measure of devotion 
And he said, wherever this gospel is preached, the gospel what? He said, anointed to my bearing, that Christ would die on the cross for our sins and be buried and rise again. Wherever the gospel goes, <clears throat> this memorial of this woman who did all that she could do, <clears throat> when she could do it, is going to be attached to it. You're going to remember Mary. And Mary did what she could. And someday, it's going to be so important. So I say at that last table, we can sit there and say, we did all we could, when we could, as we should. Amen? And one is, he said, as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. It's Sunday morning. I felt impressed upon this early in the week. Actually, last week, burdened my heart, and I have, have found it hard to get communion services in. Business meetings, other things. It's been a strange two years, I know. But no excuse. You've got to do what you can. There is a communion service prepared. It won't be long. It'll be very brief. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. You can just let the gentleman go by or let the plate go by, and that's fine. And just have a word of prayer. You're welcome to do that. But I know this. It's Memorial Day weekend. And this is something that we can do and we should do, believing that a living Lord is coming again. Amen? So what we're going to do is we're going to have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Jim, Brother Wayne, and Brother Matt Trump to go back table. And there'll be two plates of bread and there'll be two plates of a drink. And then they'll just, while Miss Nancy comes, she's going to play the piano a few songs. And as they come by, you can take one piece of the bread and one cup of the fruit of vine. And if it's in your heart and the Lord is, no, you just want to have prayer, you're welcome to do that. If you want to, if you want to partake, you're welcome to do that and say, Lord, this helps me remember what you did for me. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Holy Father, as you come.